How's it going on here? I'm officially ready to look at everything video games. I've already talked about Parabola Rapper, what else can I talk about? How about everything? Yeah, I think I can do that, I hope that when I finish this I won't be 30. Video games, they exist and were created to be accepted as a form of media. Yeah, you've never noticed. I like video games. These plastic cases containing a disc or a cartridge mean a lot to me. But what if we go back to where it all started? No, we're not going back to the first domestic console or even Pong. We'll get there, but our starting point is before everything mentioned. We're going to the 50s. The 50s suck. What else can I say? If there's no Metroid Fusion, what the f do I do? Luckily this guy, A.S. Douglas, comes around and in 1952 he made what everyone calls the first ever video game, OXO. No thank you, this doesn't deserve a gone style rant at all. But at all seriousness, this was revolutionary. It's a simple game of tic-tac-toe, but if you're British, just like this dude, nos and crosses, or if you're f***ing Irish, then X's and O's. OXO was created for the ADSAC, one of the first stored program computers, and just look at this game. It's success! I know that I'm pissing around to a 1952 game, but even for the first game ever, it's bad. Even at the time was bad. It was a step on the right direction, but it's not really functional. Some even say that this doesn't qualify as the first video game, because it lacks on movement. But in my opinion, what we are looking now is the first video game ever created. Period. Nothing happened until 1958, everyone forgot about this game's existence and moved on. But then William Hishbutton, aka name that I'll never say ever again, made Tennis for Two, and this some people consider as the first, but I've already made a statement before. The guy helped on the creation of the atomic bomb and made this game in two hours. What a dedication! Now let's talk about the game. This looks far more interesting than OXO. No lag! That alone leaves more recent games on the dust. Whoever saw that a game from the 50s had better frame rate than Grand Theft Auto V. Simple as it gets, a ball bounces around back and forth and the two players need to control the two sides. And one title that this game gets is the first multiplayer game of all time. Alexa went one player against the CPU, but Tennis for Two was actually two players. Now leaving the 50s, thank god, in 1962 we got Space War. Yes, with an exclamation mark, I think it deserves it, because this game is actually decent. This game was the pioneer of space games, it inspired such classics as Space Invaders and Asteroids. This decade actually lacked video games, alongside Space War and some text computer games, not much else happened. I'm actually surprised, I thought that after Tennis for Two, more video games would be made, but no, I only found 4 documented games from the 60s. What a bummer. But the most important thing wasn't the games, but the first console ever was created between 1967 and 1968, created by Rolf Bayer. As in peace by the way, the brown box was the very first appearance of playing video games indoors. But the only downside is that it wasn't commercialized. This was just a project that Bayer made and years later he would sell the idea to Magnavox, but we'll get there. Now this is what we've been waiting for. The 70s! In 1971 we got classic computer games like the Oregon Trail. I've actually never played the Oregon Trail, the only thing I know is that it's wicked difficult and it's about surviving the long Oregon Trail. At least that's what the American Dad episode tells me. In 1971 we got the first arcade game machine ever, Computer Space. Yeah, you see everyone saying that the first video game ever was Dance for 2 and the first arcade game ever was Pong, but now we know that's false information. Just look at this thing! It looks like a big boxing glove made out of plastic with a screen. Can you blame them? This thing is forgettable. Now Pong, from Atari, is the definition of old stinky stinky arcade machine. This one is a classic, a standard arcade machine from 1972 with wood on the sides and yellow on the front. Now the game itself? It's not to love, this game is simple but awesome. One player controls one side, another player controls the other. This game was obviously inspired by Tennis for Two, but I prefer it more. Pong was a very influential game, but it's strange that games like Tetris and Pac-Man get new versions every single year, but Pong doesn't get nothing. I never noticed that before, but it's true. So we have Pong and arcades, right? Why don't we get arcades in our homes? I think that's a brilliant idea, and they sure did too, because in 1972, months before the Pong released actually, this predated the original Pong arcade, the Magnavox Odyssey was unleashed into this world. 
This is what we came from the brown box. Buyers saw the idea of a console to be sold on the market, and we got it. This thing is weird, you look at this and you know it's a 70s console. This design looks extremely off and the controllers are plain odd. To run the games we had circuit cards, not cartridges, but close enough. It also came with a thing that predated graphics, a bunch of useless stuff, and gosh, who on the right mind thought this was a good idea? The games are just one slim stick and a six stick. Why not just make a port of Pong? That's exactly what happened. Pong consoles began to circulate on the market and they all came with two objectives. Play Pong and weird designs. This one is a triangle. This is where Atari released their first console, but that's obvious given the fact that they made Pong, so their version of a Pong console would emerge. Around 1975, Magnavox discontinued the Odyssey. What a surprise, the thing didn't even sell games separately, what was the point? And because of that, and a dozen of Pong consoles that were all the same, the video game industry crash of 1977 happened. Also known as the Forgotten Game Crash, this one isn't talked as much. Maybe because of the other game crash that we'll talk later that foreshadowed it. And to be honest, I only discovered it 5 minutes ago. Who cares, the Atari 2600 released the same year and everything went back to normal. That was fast. Atari put the game crash to rest with the 2600 and it was a success. This time, all the games were bundled with the console, and were all different games with better graphics. The 2600 controller was also revolutionary. Now it was small, with a stick and a red button. Many good games also came in the early years of the 2600. Breakout, Space Evaders, a game that launched prior on the arcade and was a success, Asteroids, Galaxian, and so much more. What more can I say, this thing had an interesting way to advertise itself, but we're not here to talk about commercials. This is the first years of gaming, damn it. In 1979, the first portable console released, the Microvision. And it's obvious by looking at it that it's a 70s console, it didn't sell well. And now this is kinda rare. Also, a very small Japanese toy company called Nintendo decided to test their luck on the gaming industry with an arcade game called Rather Scope. It was a massive flop. What comes after 1979? That's right, Pac-Man released! Alongside the 80s, Namco released Pac-Man for the arcade, and it was the talk of the town. Pac-Man is one of the most iconic characters of all time, and this was a pretty big deal, and soon many arcades were to come. Tic Tac was the next Namco game, and it didn't make a great hit as Pac-Man, but still a massive success. Galaga also released, very similar to Galaxian, but I prefer it more. The failure of Rider Scope led to many things, and when I say things, I refer to Donkey Kong. The game was originally going to be about Popeye, but because Nintendo lost the rights to it, Shigeru Miyamoto proposed the idea of Donkey Kong and finally, in 1981, it released. This game became as big or bigger than Pac-Man back in the day. It introduced the world to Donkey Kong, Jumpman, that would later become Mario, and Pauline from everyone's favorite, Mario vs Donkey Kong. Also around this time, Nintendo released the Game & Watch handheld games. These weren't as big as Donkey Kong nor the 2600, but were a little popular around Japan and the US. Atari on the other hand, they were pretty wild. Everything at Atari was doing great. Games were selling, the new Atari 5200 released, and they had some competition, but to be honest it was mm, friendly competition. We had the Magnavox Odyssey 2 from Magnavox, god how I hate this console, I've played this one in the past and oh man it really sucks. The design stinks, the control looks like they didn't even bother to make it good, and the games weren't the best. Enough of talking about the Odyssey 2, there was also the Intellivision, I like this one. Even if the controller looks like a TV remote or a cell phone, this console is awesome, and the games were also decent and better than the Odyssey 2. The ColecoVision is the one that existed and we need to accept it. All seriousness, the ColecoVision ain't that bad. It had a solid library and everything was just solid. Better than the Odyssey 2, I say. Now the fact tracks. What an odd bugger of a console. A console that's literally a TV, a controller that looks like an arcade, the weird format and the weird aspect ratio, everything about it is just plain weird. Just look at it in action. I don't hate it, but it's very aesthetically pleasing. Atari couldn't be happier with these consoles as rivals, at this point they were bringing up money basically. Everything was great, around this time so many games were released such as Spider-Man, Pitfall, ports of arcade games like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Frogger, Donkey Kong Jr and Mario Bros. On June 11th, 1982, 
it hit the extraterrestrial, directed by Steven Spielberg, hit the cinemas in the US, and it was an instant success. E.T. became a pop culture icon and it was everywhere, you couldn't escape it, and with a big success like this, a game needed to be released. So in 1983, a team got a few weeks to develop a game for the Atari 2600 for the holiday season, to capitalize on the success of the movie. And hey, it released on holiday 83, and if you went to your local game store, there it was, the E.T. video game. Was it good? You already know the answer, no. No, it was sh This game had lots of problems, it was the buggiest game of the system, and it was clearly unfinished. Atari was waiting for a cease and desist since the game's release, they knew it was sh before releasing it, but it was worse than a simple cease and desist. This was a game crash, but the biggest, the game crash of 1983. The game industry began to be considered a trend and everyone just started to forget about video games. E.T. the video game started something dreadful that will always be remembered by many people everywhere. And because of this, some stores stopped selling games, everyone threw away their 2600s, arcades were empty, and Atari buried some of their games in the state of New Mexico, and a few moments later, they shut down their operations. Atari was no more. These were the first years of gaming. Yeah, old. This was going to happen sooner or later. I still question to this day, how was this going to work for Atari? 